today. This is Senate Finance. Uh, this is September 2nd, and I'm going to call the meeting to order. First item on the agenda is um, we're going to continue our discussion on broadband, and Peter Blum and Fred Goldstein are with us. I don't see that Steve Whitaker has joined us yet, but I think today we're going to hear a little bit more about fixed wireless. Um, there was a little discussion about that yesterday. And so um, I'm going to Senator Pearson and Senator Sorotkin, who is Madam muted. Chair, I, I just, I'd appreciate some context from you. We're all very interested in broadband. We need, we do have an oversight role with the department. Um, and a lot of us, uh, well, I think maybe all of us are interested in some of the planning, but I'm curious if, to your knowledge, is there an assignment, um, you know, in this little session here for September that I, I'd like to help, it would help me if, if I had in mind some of the goal of, or if this is okay. just more of an update. This is really part of our, I, um, update. I know some of the uh, contracts that have been awarded were for fixed wireless. I know uh, yesterday there was some discussion about the CUDs doing some fixed wireless to start out. And eventually, if I think we'll go through this second, but if um, all the contracts are not um, you know, all the money isn't put out in contract, we're going to have to decide and make some legislative adjustments as to where it might go. So this is mostly on for information at this point. Um, Senator Sorotkin, did you have a question? You're muted. There I you go. To, Madam Chair, take a point of personal privilege and have the Senate Finance Committee congratulate Senator Pearson on his uh, election, uh, not election, his primary recount, <laughs> which was very intense. And Congratulations. So I'm putting up my thumbs up. Uh, okay, thumbs up from everyone. That's okay. That's got to oh. be a... Uh... Congratulations, landslide. Yeah. <laughs> what what was you. the final count? 28 votes. It was a 45 on election night, reduced to 28. We found that out yesterday during our hearing, and just just uh, an hour ago, the judge issued the final order or whatever. So it's done. Wow. It's official. Thank you. Congratulations. Learning all this stuff is not for naught. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna go, okay, Steve Whitaker has joined us by phone. Um, I have Peter Blum on first. Peter, I don't know if you've talked to anyone or there's any particular order. Um, I, think this, I think this works for us, Madam Chair. Okay. I'll go first That's and then I, I'm not sure whether Steven or Fred wanna go second, but they've worked that out. Okay. Um, so um, thank you for the invitation to speak here today. Just to refresh your memory, I lived in Vermont for 35 years, but I'm now a resident of Massachusetts um, and I'm speaking to you from there. Um, I have done some work recently in Vermont um, with Fred and with Stephen uh, for the, uh, we thought about maybe applying for, for the department's, uh, to be the department's consultant for the uh, planning project and decided not to do that. And we've done some work together for the Central Vermont Fiber District. So I know these guys and sort of, we know what each of us has been thinking recently, at least on some of these issues. I wanted to make sure that um, I try to address as best I can, Senator Brock's list, which I received this morning. Um, Senator Brock, is, is, is the committee familiar with that list already or should I uh, try to review some of the items in it? If you don't the mind list me was asking. provided to all members of the committee. I'm not sure how many people have had a chance to okay. through it. Well, 
What I, what I would like to do, I had some prepared remarks and I think that fits loosely into your framework. So if you feel like you'd like to stop me, feel free at any time. Um, the, um, the, the questions, some of the questions involved how the state is going about trying to achieve universal broadband service. And um, you've had, of course, this emergency grant of funding, which you've allocated through uh, recent legislation. And the way a lot of this money has gone out, I'm not prepared to tell you what percentage it is, but a lot of it has gone out as grants to proprietary existing providers who build, want to extend their uh, proprietary networks. And that includes the major cable provider and the major telecom in, uh, provider in Vermont. And this may have been a reasonable emergency measure to take in the short term, but there still are a lot of problems. If your goal is still to eventually get high quality broadband to nearly everyone in the state, this strategy was easy to start with 15 years ago when you decided that you would start helping the existing utilities expand their networks. But it has become increasingly costly over time. And I predict that this will continue. Years ago, um, the low hanging fruit on broadband was people living in the towns and the cities close together with short cable runs, short fiber runs, and the um, existing utilities built, it, built out to many customers using private capital. And they built out just as far as it seemed profitable to do so at the time. But now you've got a new problem. You're stuck with trying to pick the fruit that's higher up on this broadband tree. And you're finding that you have to use public funds. In the recent rounds of awards, it's my understanding that some of the awards amounted to about $4,000 per address served. This seems like an extraordinary benefit to relatively few individuals. I'm sure there are other things that probably exceed this, but you're spending in some cases a lot of money to get broadband out to relatively few people. That in itself may be a problem, but it's not clear that the strategy will ever succeed. The interim steps ultimately could make it harder for the communication union districts to make a profit on new fiber runs, something that the law now requires, making a profit that is. They have to be able to be cash flow positive in order to float their bonds. <clears throat> In a few years, when they're looking at a new fiber run to the end of a rural road, the most profitable portions of that road will already be served. This leaves the CUDs with very high costs and will likely leave the state with either a need for continuing subsidies or facing yet another failure to reach every household. So I recommend that as a planning measure, you encourage whoever it is you give the planning job to, to focus on the end game. If you still expect 100 megabits up and down for every customer in Vermont, that's gonna be very expensive and likely is gonna require some continuing subsidies. One possibility I suppose is that at some point you'll just decide that that fruit, some of that fruit is just too high up on the tree and you can't really afford to reach it. I'm not suggesting that any other states with rural areas have really figured this out completely, but many are doing better than Vermont is doing. Having a good state plan to get consensus around the end game would be extremely helpful. Interim steps such as these grants should not make the end game more difficult but you can't know that until you know what your end game is. You asked, Senator Brock, you asked about CUDs. I think CUDs may be a reasonable approach to an end game strategy, but they are not on the verge of solving the problem soon. Some, perhaps many are relying on volunteers, although it's helpful that they recently received grants that let them get started at least having some professional staff. They need more experience. They need a prototype on how to adopt best practices. 
which means help from the state. And they need training on how to live with the public records and public meeting rules. Something that at least in central Vermont has been very controversial. So giving the CUDs technical and advisory help getting on their feet seems to me a very good idea. Now you also asked about fixed wireless. Um, as I mentioned before, some of the senators got on. Um, Fred Goldstein is our uh, best resource on this. And I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions when Fred, uh, when Fred speaks about fixed wireless. All I wanna say is that fixed wireless instead of fiber may be a near best solution in many areas. Fixed wireless has other advantages in that money spent on this technology can also expand cell coverage and help with emergency communications. But again, there are a lot of complexities. One major complexity is getting access to a broad enough band of spectrum. You may, you probably know that spectrum has been auctioned by the FCC and the best and most useful spectrum in Vermont is owned by private telephone companies, notably VTEL. When we were working for Central Vermont Fiber, we initiated a very uh, positive interaction with Michelle Gatte, who I know is, has some uh, difficulties historically in Vermont. But I wanna tell you that he has a lot of spectrum that can be very useful for fixed wireless. And I found him quite uh, helpful in considering what Vermont's needs might be in Central Vermont. Um, I also want to comment on the secrecy question, Senator Brock. Um, the state has, in my opinion, allowed too much to remain secret about the network. Even the location of fiber runs in the public right away today are kept as confidential trade secrets. I think this is poor policy and I think it should be overruled. First of all, for something to be a trade secret, it has to be capable of being a secret at all. There is nothing hidden or secret about the location of fiber runs on roadside utility poles. It's also been suggested that you could support the, the compilation and publishing of a GIS database on poles and fiber locations. I see several potential benefits for this. It could be easier and more competitive to obtain interconnection at fiber meet points. Now I take this second hand, but Fred knows a lot about obtaining fiber interconnection. And you may want to ask him some questions about that. My sense of it is that if there was an existing fiber map in central Vermont, a lot of work could have been avoided um, when they were setting up the proposals for that network. It could be easier and, and more uh, competitive to get interconnection and there would be a market um, price that likely would be lower than the prevailing price right now. Secret interconnection agreements are poor policy, especially if we are pretending that telecommunications is provided in competitive markets. If our whole structure is based upon the benefits of competition, then there should be a market. And you can't have a market if you don't have pricing information. Markets require pricing signals. This is a lesson that we have learned and unlearned at least twice. We learned in the 1920s when we required telephone companies to interconnect. And there are probably some of those early statutes are still in Title 30 in Vermont statutes. Um, and then we unlearned it when we let them go to um, proprietary networks. In the 1990s, we tried again with the 96 Act to create something called competitive local exchange providers. And there was a great deal of regulation that came out of the FCC in the States about how CLEX so-called would interconnect with the incumbent LEX. And um, it was understood when the 96 Act passed that if that interconnection couldn't be accomplished effectively and at reasonable prices, the whole concept of the Act would fail. Secondly, this database could make it easier to anticipate transmission failures, like the isolation of telephone switches. Many years ago when uh, Governor Snelling was in office, there was a train derailment. Um, there are all sorts of 
ice storms and events that, that break cables and, and, uh, and fibers. And having a map of this uh, network could be very helpful for emergency services. And finally, I would mention that in my opinion, it's, it's more than I wanna go into today, but um, your tax policy about taxing telecommunications seems to me quite obsolete and having this database about where the poles are and where the connections are could be very useful in terms of opening up our opportunities for tax reform. And that's all I have to say. And I'd like to yield now, or I'd like to answer questions first and then yield if you, you know, to uh, Fred or Stephen, but I'll take questions. Okay, Sandra Pearson has a question. Thank you, uh, Peter. I, 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 you know, I'm just principally interested in, in the mapping and, and the understanding, I think the public, as you say, has that, it's in the public right away, we should understand what's going on. But I wanna better understand something you said that if we had uh, this understanding of where there is fiber around the state, there could have been some cost savings, I think, to central Vermont. Is that what you were, you were saying? I wasn't, I'm not so sure about the cost savings. I think it would have simplified their design when they were looking for ways to tie in the facilities that they were, the end, the end, the last mile facilities that they were building, how to tie those into the, the, the backbone of the internet. How come, so square it with me, if, if we have, have to accept the for-profit private motor, you know, motivations that go with it for telecom, why then any efficiency that could have been gained would be dependent on somebody leasing access or something. So why didn't the market just take care of that? I, I want to understand it better because I am interested in, in opening this up to the public view, but uh, it's, it would help me to understand that better. I, I think it's widely accepted that in the, in the industry, that if you can keep the locations and, inter, and interconnection details secret, you can get a better deal from the next guy who comes through the door. That you can, you can be a price setter as the seller rather than a market have to, have to attach yourself to a market price. Um, this is a constant problem in regulation. Um, 10 years ago or so, when I worked at the National Regulatory Research Institute, I did a study on something called Special Access, which was a telephone company lingo for point-to-point -point access. And the, um, the telephone companies, the AT&T and Verizon, were going to extraordinary lengths to keep secret and to require their customers to keep secret the terms of their interconnection agreements. And the reason to do so was purely economic because I, I never, they never admitted this to me, but it would seem perfectly obvious to me that they believed that by keeping the prices secret that they could do better on overall revenue, that it was a good business strategy. Fred may have more to do with, to say about this because he's worked more in industry than I have. Does that answer your question, Senator Pearson? Uh, I think so, <laughs> or it begins okay. to, thank you. Okay. Senator Brock, I see your hand. Am I, am I, should I call on you? Or? Well, um, I heard from the chair quietly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> just a question regarding uh, the issue of uh, uh, the secrecy versus openness of what's on the polls of the public right away. Uh, how do other states deal with this? I think generally most states do it the same way we do. I think we, what, we, what that is, as I understand it, is that when a, um, the Department of Public Service or the Public Utilities Commission asks for information that a, a utility or a communications provider that's not a utility feels should be treated as a trade secret, the uh, granting of that <coughs> trade secret status is stated as being provisional, subject to challenge. But, in, but there's nobody really in the, in the whole system that has an incentive to challenge it. So by and large, it just stays secret. And so um, there, there is a process by which someone could challenge it, but nobody seems to do that. And so you wind up with you know, the whole state being uh, wired with fiber that 
Nobody in the public sector really knows where it is. Um, now, some of the fiber is not like that. I mean, I think Velco has been, as I understand it, has been pretty straightforward in sharing where its fiber is. But I don't think that the telephone company or the cable companies have done so. And it's, it, it's, it's not that the department probably thinks that it ought to be secret. It's just too much work to challenge every, every single filing. Madam Chair, we have one person on, on, online here today who makes a habit of trying to find that out and is consistently- Okay, He's, we're gonna get to him. I okay. think I saw Senator Pearson and then Senator yeah. Sorotkin. Sorry to ask another question, but but don't utilities have to file something with the public service, actually with the PUC, in order to string? Isn't there isn't there isn't that a publicly controlled process? Um, there are there's a process for setting towers that requires a permit. Uh, there's a process that's really a regulated private process for attaching to poles. Yeah, but that's the, what I'm that's thinking between, of, the attachment. But that doesn't happen at, in the, at the department or the board? Um, the, no, a, a pole attachment is negotiated between the attacher and the pole owner pursuant to okay. rules that are either set by the FCC or by the state. And disputes can be taken to the PUC, but I'm not aware that any have. Usually they're just worked out. I'm not really up to date on the latest developments. That the board, I think the board took a undertook a, um, a, a docket on this, and I don't think there was any any change. But I, I can't really speak from knowledge about what that docket did or didn't do. Does that does that answer it, Senator Pearson? Senator Sorotkin. Uh, Peter. Uh, you piqued my interest at the very end when you started talking about how polls and revenue might intersect. And I didn't quite understand what you were getting at. You mentioned the word might affect revenue policies and... Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm reaching out quite a ways here. I, I, I can see why it was a little obscure. Um, Vermont's... Uh, I'm, I'm reluctant to tell the finance committee how Vermont's tax structure works. But uh, my understanding of it is that um, there is a telephone personal property tax that is quite old and that is based upon the assumption that the best way to appraise that property is through depreciated original cost, which was the numbers that were sitting around easily available in the old days when telephone companies were regulated and they kept their books according to the uniform system of accounts. Um, today, it's not at all clear. There are all sorts of reasons why that might not be a fair basis for taxation. Um, it might be that the books don't reflect all of the investment. It might be that the depreciation has long ago come and gone. Um, it might be, I don't know. There are a lot of reasons why that looks really obsolete to me. Um, we have a universal service fund that um, is levied on revenues, telecommunications revenues. Uh, Vermont is way better than most of the states. In most states, it's only the state fund, if they have it, is based only on intrastate telecommunications revenues, which is a totally archaic distinction. And you managed to avoid that at least. But still, it's based upon telecommunications revenues. And now a lot of the money is being used for broadband, which doesn't contribute. So the thing is out of balance in a lot of ways. And one of the things that people have talked about in my hearing is that perhaps um, one way to look at this anew is to look at the facilities that the telecommunications providers are using, such as coal attachments in the public right of way. And uh, that might open up some new bases for taxation for you. Does that, does that answer, Senator Sorokin? Oh, it answers and opens a lot of questions, too. Um, yeah. What, have any other states, to your knowledge, successfully gotten beyond interstate taxation? Um, well, 
Senator, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a crank on this, actually. I, I, um, you like cranks. The, what's that? You like cranks. <laughs> um, we have a committee have full sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I have long held the view that the distinction between intrastate and interstate is a artificial creation uh, for regulatory purposes and rate setting purposes only. And whether it was ever constitutionally required is something that's debated often among lawyers, but at the very least, it's, it's irrelevant in my view to taxation. Um, many of my peers disagree with me. Brad Ramsey, who is still, I think, the general counsel at Nehru in 1996 was very adamant that the 96 Act should only allow states to surcharge intrastate revenues for universal service. I disagreed with that. There was a recent then uh, Supreme Court decision involving the Illinois sales tax statute. Um, Goldberg versus Sweet, I think was the name of the case, if I can remember it right. And in that case, the Supreme, US Supreme Court examined the Illinois sales tax statute, which led, was levied on intrastate and interstate revenues both. And the Supreme Court reviewed the taxation policy under, in the constitution and concluded that the Illinois sales tax statute was valid and enforceable. So for the purposes of designing Vermont taxes, my belief is that the distinction between intrastate and interstate is largely or entirely irrelevant. That was a long answer to respond to your use of that one word. I don't know if I just sort of went over the top on you or not, but um, I, I think that there are, there's a great deal of uncertainty in federal tax law about what's preempted and what's not. And there are different views in different circuits. If you go to the fifth circuit down in Texas, they have a very, uh, I think, crabbed view of what's allowed for the states. They, they struck down a Texas statute that I thought should have been upheld some years ago. Um, but I think, uh, I don't know how interested the committee members are in restructuring telecom taxes, but I think if, if you are, um, I think you should be constrained almost not at all by the traditional distinctions between intrastate and interstate. And I think maybe you should be looking to see if telephone property could be taxed more like other kinds of property. Okay, I think we might be, but I think that sounds like an entire session worth of work, if not Agreed. more, and it's not gonna get done in the three or four weeks we have left. I I'm not suggesting that. I, I just thought I didn't that, think so. <laughs> I just thought but, that if you had the, if you had the data, it might make it well, easier for you to consider the options. And that's my yesterday. The CUDs came in, and they were they're looking for I think it's three million dollars, somewhere between three and four, and they called it pole harvesting. I assume that is what you're talking about. They said that there was a vehicle they could rent and drive around, and then you had to walk in my backyard where all the poles are. Um, you had to walk there, and but now that's the information you're talking about, right? We know at least the major utilities can tell you basically, and there's maps of where their poles are some more or less accurate, but we don't know what's on those poles, at least until you go to get a permit, an attachment. So I assume at that point, you may know what's on the pole because you may have to pay to move it. Um, right. Would would the CUD request be a good investment for the state? Is that what I'm hearing from you? No, I'm not, I'm not prepared to express an opinion on that particular proposal. I, I think that 
having a long-term uh, or even a relatively short-term goal of trying to get that information about who's attached where um, has a lot of benefits, including the possibility of use being useful for taxation purposes. But whether that techn technology is valid or invalid okay, is not I, something I know yeah. the, least, the least thing about. I don't either. Okay, but it would be a good thing for the state to know this for a variety of reasons, one of which it might make it easier for CUDs to plan, which is what they're yes. saying they need, and that perhaps this information should remain, it should be the states that, you know, if, if the CUDs do it, do they then own it and, or should part of that yeah. be that it stays in some public utility commission or the public service department, some, some state entity is where the, the information should rest. My, uh, one of the high points of my career was uh, working for Governor Kunin many years ago when I was reminded this morning that Act 200 was famous and infamous at that time. Um, and included a lot of planning information of encouraging regional planning. And in, it began a GIS system. And that's, that's the spirit in which I'm making the suggestion. But I think if there were a free, hopefully, um, state GIS that not only includes where the roads are, but where the fiber is, there could be a lot of benefits. And it's hard to anticipate all the benefits. But as, as I mentioned, I think it could be helpful to CUDs looking for places to interconnect. It could um, provide uh, price discipline for the market for those interconnections, and it could be useful for um, emergency planning and response. And this would be fiber. We don't care where the telephone lines are. Well, if you're doing that, well, the telephone lines yeah, I mean, you do actually, you do care. You want, you probably want all the connections on any pole. I know Steve Whitaker's on and then there's E911 and I think <laughs> other things sure that we've I, had issues with. If I could, I saw Fred nodding and I think Fred is really your best resource on, okay. on how this information could be used. I'm a little bit over my depth here, out of my depth here. Well, you're way above most of us. So this, is very helpful. Um, any other questions for Peter? How would you rate Vermont <clears throat> as to what we are doing regarding broadband and broadband expansion on a scale of A through F? I guess about C. Um, I, the data that I have, Senator, are there's a uh, website, I can't think of it offhand, maybe Fred or Stephen knows it, that, that evaluates state by state um, how much broadband costs, how good it is, and how far out it is into the, into the boondocks. And in that um, survey, which may or may, not, may or may not be definitive, Vermont came out 47th of the 50 states. So some people think Vermont is way behind. I don't think it's quite that bad. I live in Western Massachusetts in Berkshire County, and there are towns in Berkshire County that are just as bad off uh, as the towns in the Northeast Kingdom as far as broadband. And actually Fred has a project in Northern Berkshire County on the Vermont line that's going to fix, they're, they're buying fixed wireless. And so he can talk to you about that. But I think, um, so the states that have done this better, I think have, it may be worth considering whether you need some um, guiding hand here at the state level that can do, um, I see it sort of like, um, like zoning was when it first came in. I don't know if any of you remember Bernie Johnson and Bill Mitchell, but they were guys who were helping the towns adopt zoning after it was first authorized in the 60s. And what they did is they went around and they explained how it was supposed to work. And they helped them draft bylaws and they helped them make decisions. And I, I just feel like the CUDs are a little bit at sea here and they need some help. 
And uh, I'm not really sure that uh, with all due respect to the department and the commissioner who I've known for many years, I'm not really sure that having the utility regulator be the leader or the promoter is the best choice. It seems to me that your motives are not primarily regulatory here. Your motives are primarily to enhance quality of life and economic development in the state. And so maybe, maybe having a different um, center for this might be useful. Is there any jurisdiction, any state that to which you would point us as a model from which we could learn? You might want to talk to the uh, Massachusetts Broadband Council. In my part of the state, they have worked with, um, they've given grants, they, they work with towns. It's not CUDs in Massachusetts, it's towns that some of them get together and form districts, but the towns basically have voted in, you know, we want, we want fiber and we're willing to pay for it. And, uh, and the state has been given grants, giving grants for that. And it's, it hasn't, Fred knows more about this again. Uh, it hasn't worked everywhere, but it has worked in a lot of places. And it looks like it's going to produce some good results in a, in a year or so. Thank you. All right, Senator Campion. Sorry, that was a while ago. I apologize. Uh, I, think my, I think my only question was, um, at the end of this, Madam Chair, where, uh, where, where are we heading? I think you touched on it in the beginning. I'm just taking notes. This is all very helpful, but is this background information for January? Uh, some of it. Some of it may be we have given very specific instructions about fiber and um, how we want the present grants to go out. We're going to have to decide if there's still money left over, what we're going to do with it. So this is obviously very complex and also somewhat new. Uh, the technologies change quickly. And so this is just basic information for us so that we can make the best decisions possible. And yeah, I'm assuming that um, I'm already thinking of, and how would I phrase a bill like that? Um, because we're gonna need a vehicle for next year. Um, we're not, we're not gonna solve this whole thing this year. I think the one thing we have is the request for the money to do the pole harvesting. And that's something we're gonna have to decide if we're going to push for um, and, you know, get before appropriations or maybe redirect some of the CRF money, but, um, or if we're going to tell somebody else, maybe we want to reinstate the telecommunications authority that was put to sleep at some point, not when I was on this committee, but, um, we may want to resurrect it if that's, seen as the best thing. So this is information harvesting. Okay. Um, so I got right, next, I have, I think Steve Whitaker on my agenda. Let me, my iPad went to sleep. I do. Um, but Fred, I, Peter said you and Steve had been talking. Have you gotten a, a, a program you want to do together or do I just follow the agenda? I have my own statements. So I'm prepared okay. to make whenever you're ready. Okay, so we'll go on. Steve, are you there? You're on mute. I see a phone, but no Steve at this point. Ah, nope, he's off mute. Can you okay. hear me now? Okay, I'm going to start with okay. a couple of. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of comments responsive to the questions that the senators have posed, the committee members, and just then I will frame my uh, responses in the context of Senator Brock's question. Okay. Uh, just start with. 
I think you should consider immediate action to get VIT restored, possibly using CRF monies, because that's a valuable tool to built on current fiber and existing techno new technology to have the necessary planning meetings and collaboration. Zoom is woefully inadequate for the level and the intensity of work we've got to do. So VIT is an option in cooperation with the AMOs that you should consider uh, launching using CRF money because it could be done VIT. before the end of the year. Yes, That's... Vermont Interactive Television. Ah, Especially okay. because it was sunset, it was sunset as part of the state college's effort to do it, go it alone, and now with the change of chancellor uh, in the economics of the colleges, it's worth revisiting that. Okay, but, uh, that's Got a it. different conversation. Yeah. Uh, I, in regards to Peter Blum's conversation about the uh, tax structure, VTA had an obligation in statute to charge all broadband providers for their use of the right-of-way. When VTA was mothballed, most of its piece parts went to the Public Service Department, but the right-of-way fee obligation went to VTRANS. So VTRANS is in violation of statute for years running now for not charging broadband providers. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should be doing that. In fact, Fred will probably make a comment that we should not charge broadband providers. But the point is that a GIS database of all the existing fiber makes it possible to study the telephone personal property tax, the universal service fund, and the right-of-way broadband revenue as one project. Broadband can also be taxed to support 911 through research that Peter found in the uh, footnotes of the Internet Tax Freedom Act. So. There, that's something that should get underway and be completed. That study should be completed in time for January. So we can pick that up another time, but I wanted to answer, respond to the question. Most important takeaway from today's testimony, I would say do not allow the $500,000 planning uh, COVID response and recovery planning funds to get spent in the next three months and not make it clear with, with expanded oversight and coordination to lay a foundation for the 10-year telecom plan next year, but also for immediate actions by the CUDs. It, it, it will not work to let the existing oversight of the department, re, we will end up wasting that money and resulting in a plan not much better than we've had so far. So I would recommend that VTRANS, public safety, Commerce, VCGI, and the department all be involved in guiding that contractor. So that's going to take immediate action, possibly without legislation, just through committee pressure, to make sure that the scope of work for that contract uh, expands the oversight. Also, put a C one of the CUD reps on that body, on that oversight. So, whole harvesting, uh, that's a problem. I, I reviewed the presentation yesterday. The, the proposal is claimed to be a trade secret. No one has vetted or consulted the references for anyone who's made that process work. Uh, it's absolutely unrealistic to spend that kind of money with that little oversight and track record in secret in this time frame. It's impossible to do that many polls in 60 days. Uh, I would suggest that we to put, either put out an RFP and start with one region and do that uh, to prove the technology. But I, I caution wholeheartedly, uh, and I've appealed the decision to, anyway, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Question one, if you, do you all have the questions in front of you that Senator Brock uh, sent out to guide our testimony? Uh, I don't think so, no. Okay, Most I'll try to just- have to have two or three screens to do that. No, I will. Not. I will briefly paraphrase the questions. Does Vermont have a broadband strategy? Does it make sense? No, the state has only a fragmented aspirational document, not a plan. We have a muddied patchwork of federal subsidies for incumbents and state subsidies in the form of loose plans and no regulation. For example, open access fiber and double pole removal are given a wink and a nod and not enforced 
creating, in effect, a subsidy for the incumbents. There's too much ability for the incumbent telecoms and the for-profit utilities like Green Mountain Power and even Velco to rake off the desirable locations, which will further inhibit the ability of CUDs to be successful. CUD municipal and cooperative management salaries are generally half of what private industry is making. This information is all protected by confidentiality. It's harder to peek under the tent. The legislature should demand that CODs take responsibility and be held accountable. Same with Velco, which is half owned by VLight. Our statutory policy for telecom policy and goals begins with the purpose of this chapter is to strengthen the state's role in telecom planning. It's about time. Second question, how important is the plan? How many years should it be for? What are the essential elements? The plan is very important, more so now with the statutory changes you affected last year in the broadband bill. This will be the first time that we have an infrastructure-based plan with specific strategies to reach every goal. It, it's fine for it to look out 10 years as long as it's updated every three years with uh, review and assessment. I will provide a more thorough vision in the interest of time, uh, a more thorough version in writing for you. Okay. Uh, I'll reiterate here, the oversight body to manage that $500,000 COVID response and recovery plan should be comprised of public safety, VTrans, commerce, public service, GIS, a CUD rep, and possibly a Velco rep. Velco has opted not to step up and be the coordinating role, yet that's ratepayer-funded infrastructure, 51% owned by the people of the ratepayers of Vermont. And we should insist that it be more transparent and more serve as the backbone to enable these CUDs. Uh, the short-term broadband plan I've uh, exposed earlier in writing, I won't jump into that here. It's useless. It, it should be set aside, and we should focus on priority planning to be ready for federal stimulus money coming our way. That does not do it. Um, Comment on the Communications Union District's obstacles for success. We're missing, right now, we're missing the integration of mobile wireless. CV Fiber may have squandered money working on a plan for a statewide, I mean, for a region-wide mobile wireless, fixed wireless strategy, which they then rejected because of the issues of cooperating with VTEL Spectrum. CUDs currently feel no obligation to integrate their plans with public safety radio, with FirstNet, with public safety LMR radio backhaul, or mobile wireless. If we could designate that a CUD owns and is responsible for a defined regulated territory, that might be the answer. Short of that, put everything in place as possible to make that happen. Hold the CUDs accountable, just as the regulators hold the electric utilities responsible. The good news is that CUDs are required to be transparent, but even this will require legislative clarification to remedy current practices, as Peter alluded to. This doesn't happen with Velcro and GMP. If we don't demand accountability from the CUDs, we might as well not have them. While the CUDs lack technical competence now, they will build it. Uh, the state should define the statewide strategy and architecture with a focus on resilience, disaster planning, and coordination with best use of existing infrastructure, including Velco fiber. Local solutions and plans will be different, but they will fit together in different parts of the state. Provide state-level engineering support to build that local capacity. Don't ask the CUDs to each go out and find a different professional with a different uh, agenda to design non-compatible architectures. The Public Service Department has not hired a telecommunications engineer since the late Charlie Larkin was retired in about 2006. Um, the CUD should not have, probably not have veto power, but should inform and propose conditions to be attached to public funding of commercial network projects. Then how can, how can short-term installations of fixed wireless best integrate with fiber and other long-term solutions? They can serve to locate the fiber in the backhaul solutions, the fiber-connected buildings. They can build vertical assets 
even if they're only temporary poles, to support fixed wireless, Wi-Fi, public safety radio, and LTE small cells supporting mobile wireless. As long as the CUDs own the installation, it becomes part of their asset base. Regulatory environment, I'm not going to dive into that. Uh, if you wanted to be broadband to every, how would you go about it? Fixed In this order, fixed wireless, small cells serving both fixed and mobile, resilient rings managed or assembled from all carriers and Velco, shared fiber aggregation to support otherwise non-economic builds, fiber builds, and then the CUDs have only a short distance to go to reach these rings. CUDs will build the laterals, evolving eventually into a mesh architecture. Cell phone, I've already said, we cannot afford to miss the opportunity to integrate mobile wireless with our current investments of public funds. How should the electric utilities be involved in broadband expansion? The electric utilities can and should build engineered fiber in the electric space and then lease that to the CUDs. That's the most cost-effective method of financing and maintaining the fiber. They have the trucks, they have the contractors, they have the space, they don't pay their own pole attachments. They will maintain and restore as necessary. They must participate in an integrated planning process for rapid restoral because it's not sufficient to leave communications down as long as some areas uh, have suffered electric outages. Um, that's the gist of it, unless you have questions. That's a lot. Uh, Steve, uh, can you submit that in writing if you haven't already? Yes, I've just been uh, typing it as Peter was speaking, so yes, I can. Uh, okay, that slightly, would be great, because I think yep. you gave us a lot to think about. I've been taking some notes, but um, it will be helpful to have the whole thing. Senator Brock, you have... Well, one of the things, uh, Steve, that you mentioned is this notion of integrating the various components uh, of, of people who are involved from the CUDs to the proprietary operations uh, and legacy providers and so on uh, in terms of how to get to universal broadband. How do you make people who are independent companies who have their own commercial interests, how do you make them part of something? How do you force them to do that, particularly when the state does not have uh, uh, regulatory authority over most internet providers. Is that uh, actually, I only mentioned Velco as the uh, participant in that uh, plan oversight process. I did not mention Consolidated or Comcast. The levers we have, the most important lever we have on Comcast, on Comcast is state funding. If we're going to give them Money. public funds to build a line extension, we should require that open access fiber be pulled along with it, and that be made available to the CUDs to put up mobile wireless or fixed wireless. Secondly, consolidated uh, incentive regulation plan expires next July, and the new plan that they have yet to propose has to be found by the Public Utilities Commission to be consistent with our 10-year plan. So I believe we will need to delay the adoption, push back the adoption of that incentive reg plan until our 10-year plan is complete and our leverage over consolidated is if they want their incentive reg plan, they need to make all their fiber available to CUDs or the unused fiber. And if they don't, what's the impact on them? They don't get their incentive reg plan. And the incentive reg plan is a long leash that, that they basically get to do what they want wherever they want. And it's, it's a, not an entitlement. Well, I, what I'm trying to ask really is what's the fight? What, what do you see? And, and I realize this is, is from a, a long view, the effect on them if they say no. Does this, uh, in effect, damage, destroy, hinder, or cripple their uh, ability to operate in Vermont? Or do they no, operate? I think without that? I think consolidated over time will become more and more of a middle mile fiber. They will make more and more of their revenue off leasing middle mile fiber and less and less off their consumers. The department has started speaking about converting, shifting the obligation 
for carrier of last resort to the CUDs. And that is a very fraught because the resilience of fiber networks during power outages is not the same as battery powered uh, central office consolidated infrastructure. So if we're going to free consolidated from the obligations of last carrier of last resort and shift that burden to the CUDs, uh, we need to do that very thoughtfully and carefully because the resilience and the uh, the potential to block 911 calls is enormous. I'll pick this up with you another time, Senator Brock. Thank you. Another question, Senator McDonald. So, um, uh, Steve, Steve is telling us about our planning and um, our expenditures are need to be consistent with our 10 year plan. Is that, is that correct? Is that what you were saying, Steve? What, what I'm saying is that the currently the way the grants are being given out, the with the emergency broadband action plan and all of the connectivity grants. In fact, much of 202 uh, E, which is the connectivity initiative, uh, in effect bypasses the uh, statutory goals of 202 C. Uh, so the, we, we currently, the telecommunications and connectivity advisory board should be required under statute to review every one of these proposals for consistency with the 10 year, the 10 year plan. And if it, in its absence, the goals of 202 C and 202 E, because the thank department you, is you. not doing thank, it. Thank you. My, that sort of answers my question. Doesn't the 10 year plan, wasn't it to expire in December of this year? It, it, the new one was supposed to be prepared in December, but they've pushed that, the legislature, uh, as part of the bill you just passed, moved that date out until next June, which is okay. what creates okay. the problem. Okay. That, that won't be done in time to affect the consolidated incentive reg plan. Well, then. In this interim time, when we pushed it out until June, um, will will the uh, the department be able to make arrangements or deals or proposals based on the plan that should have expired in December? Or have There's we in our plan. legislation, or have we in our There's legislation said the department will not make such decisions until next June when the new plan is? is uh, up and rolling. Which of which the situation there? Senator, the 10-year the plan doesn't expire. The last time we had a duly adopted 10-year plan was 2004. The 2018 plan, which Senator Brock's questions asked for a comment on, was somewhat of a farce of asking for calling the first draft the final draft, and all it is is a background document. It does not have strategies to achieve the goals. So we have not had a duly adopted 10-year plan since 2004. So when we extended the due date for the new plan to next June, are we currently permitting or directing the department to grant various proposals and fund things that are yet unplanned, not in a plan? No, they're just not, right now, it's not explicitly required that they adhere to the goals or consistency of the goals of 202C and 202E. That's what you should put in any legislation you move or any more funding you provide to the connectivity initiative is to make sure that the, the core principles of competitive choice, open access, uh, not soon outmoded technology, be adhered to in these grants, because that, that will level the playing field between the CUDs and the incumbents, and it will make sure that we're not wasting this public money. So currently, the department has the authority to authorize things that are not competitive, that are uh, outdated, or, or things that deny open access. Is that yes, correct? the department has the commissioner has full discretion to uh, overlook all of those statutory requirements and and hand out this money. And that's what we're that's what's going on right now. That they can overlook those things. 
in some cases, yes, it is. Uh, the the, okay. the open Thank access you. provision, the ability of fiber being built to be leased by a competitor or by a CUD uh, is, is not explicit in the agreements and the grants that we're giving out. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, other questions for Steve? Okay. Thank you, Steve. And if you can get that to us, I'm hoping that somebody from the public service department is listening because I kind of feel we need to give them a chance to uh, state their case. Um, and we will schedule that at some point. But Fred, why don't you, we're on to you. So the Thank floor you. is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to address uh, some general issues and then uh, some of Senator Brock's specific questions, uh, noting that uh, Mr. Bloom and Mr. Whitaker have already made some very good answers on some of these questions. One of the issues we have to look at is coordinating the different activities around the state. And coordination in general is important in many regards. Without coordination, the market doesn't really meet the public needs all the time, especially when it's not profitable. We can look at what happened at the federal level with the pandemic response when PPEs were left to the states and the major problems that resulted from the lack of national coordination. Well, we look at telecom and it's really been the same way since the 1990s when as a federal policy, telecom evolved from being a quote utility to quote a market. Uh, that hasn't always worked. It has brought competition and very good benefits from competition in most places. But Vermont was largely left behind because it hasn't been as profitable. And responding to the telecom and information needs of the pandemic also is suffering from the lack of coordination. Uh, and again, this is not specific to Vermont. This is how it works in most places. And Vermont may actually be doing better than some others, but it still is a general problem because the national structure of telecom has been let the market decide with some subsidy money given out on multi-year terms uh, by the federal government and some smaller subsidies within some states. The market approach fails when there aren't competitors. Now, there's a way to look at this. Where is competition going to happen and where is there <laughs> literally a natural monopoly? <laughs> Fiber, the physical facility, is the natural monopoly in most places. Services provided across fiber, like telephone, internet, uh, video, those are naturally competitive, and they could pay rent to a fiber if there were a fiber utility. Vertical integration, having the fiber and the services owned by the same, was not the idea behind the Telecom Act of 1996. That actually had a concept of unbundling. The FCC later adopted vertical integration because it allowed the natural monopoly to reduce the competition for services for the large incumbent companies that frankly had the ear of the FCC. In other words, the federal business model is wrong. Another approach that would have probably worked better and hasn't happened in the US, it has happened in some other countries, is to instead have what sometimes is called a loopco, a company that owns just the physical fiber, copper, and the, the buildings where they meet, and that rents the those to the service providers. Uh, there was one instance sort of like that in the US where Windstream, which is uh, an incumbent telephone company in some areas, spun off its physical assets to a company called CSL, now called Unity Fiber. Uh, and they didn't do this in order to open it up. In fact, there were some restrictions they placed on it contractually. But the idea was that the fiber could be owned by a real estate investment trust with more favorable treatment than the telephone company. So for tax advantages, they literally created a loopco. But a loopco created with an open access, it totally independent, would be one long-term view I'm just putting on the table that it's, it's like an elephant in the room that keeps getting missed in the US discussion. Now, I want to address some of uh, Senator Brock's very good questions and point out with regard to the plan, 
um, <clears throat> as Steve pointed out, a plan requires flexibility and review. The farther out you look, the more likely it is that during <clears throat> the time, the underlying assumptions will become obsolete. So a 10-year plan looking out 10 years is very speculative. Looking out only the three to five years, you're much more able to do action. And so you can have the long-term guidance, but really you have to think about action in a somewhat shorter time frame, because both improvements in technology and because the federal policies and federal subsidies come and go. We don't know now what's going to happen over 10 years, just as 10 years ago, we didn't know where the technology was going to go in some other areas. So it's a soft focus, but yes, an action plan can be based on a three to five year view. As far as the uh, question four, the question about the obstacles to the success of the CUDs. Well, one thing, of course, they need is access to funding. They also need the unbiased expert help. They need the cord that could work at a statewide level in which they receive help in di and direction, not from a technology vendor, not someone who is trying to sell them a product, but from yeah. just neutral views of how, how to stay out of trouble, how to get going, how to build, how to stay out of trouble. Um, now, a CUD can't have veto power over competition. That would violate federal law, but uh, it does make sense to limit the amount of subsidized competition. If you have a CUD, you don't want to subsidize someone to come in and compete with them uh, in, in a wasteful way. So you have to look at where funding and, and who makes the decision about who gets the funding, whether it's the CUD or another agency is a different question, but one does want to avoid too much overlapping uh, of subsidization. Uh, but the less competition, then the more the monopolist, even if a subsidized monopoly, needs to be open. You know, you can say, well, you know, the big carriers who are not subsidized aren't open. And the FCC, frankly, has gone well too far and taken away the traditional common carrier obligations that used to apply to the incumbent telephone companies like Consolidated. Consolidated is no longer under obligation to make its fiber available. They make more money now leasing fiber for backhaul to sell sites than on telephone service, but they don't have to make it available. That's a legal distinction. Um, if it's subsidized, it should be open access. It should be on a fair and reasonable basis to everyone. So another question about CUDs really is another big one. Is a CUD's job to be a business and make a profit, maximize their own profitability, or is their business to facilitate the availability of adequate service at reasonable price to everyone in their district? Because if there are services available, competing with an existing service might not be a good thing for them to be doing, at least in the short to medium term. They should focus on reaching the unserved. That's a question because the, most, the highest profit, if I look at Central Vermont, where I've already done some work, we could have taken a more profitable view going in and overbuilding Comcast and Barry and Montpelier and the low cost to serve areas. But the plan that we came up with, my team came up with was leave those areas alone. If they already serve 25, three or greater, we're not gonna go there initially. We're gonna go to the places that don't have service now because the real role as we looked at it and as the CUD people agreed with us, the real role was to make sure everyone was served. So take what money, our initial money and capital, and find the places that are that sweet spot. They're high enough density to be worth serving with fiber and low enough density that they're not yet served by anyone else. And the, we, there are a lot of those places. So you know, it's, it's those sorts of issues need to be resolved uh, as a general policy question uh, as, as, as to where to build. Now, wireless has two very different long-term roles here. Uh, one role is to reach the people who are not affordably accessible to fiber, the most remote areas. And that has the intermediate and short-term need, those before fiber reaches them. And there may be some who fiber just isn't going to reach 
you may say the 10 year plan is to reach 100%. But in practice, you run into situations where there are no power poles. There are a lot of properties on the list of E911 sites that are camps that are off the grid. They don't have electricity. They're just on dirt roads in remote places and they're occupied maybe two months of the year. Bringing fiber to them would be very expensive and do people really need fiber to the camp? It's an honest question. You know, that's not their primary residence. They're going there to get away from the world. So they may are be unlikely to subscribe. So from a business point of view, you, you and then you have a handful of year-round residents in remote locations where they're mostly camps. And again, the economics there may make it very hard to get fiber to them, but easier to reach larger areas with wireless. So better they should have. 25 megabits of wireless than nothing, even if they can't get 100 or more on fiber. So that's one purpose of fixed wireless. Another is that the vertical assets that are built, poles that are erected can be used for other purposes. At the same time, they can support mobile fill-in, mobile small cell into the hollows. Because when you go through a lot of places in Vermont, there's no mobile service because of the terrain. But a small cell, on a you know, pole, 50 to 70 foot, not just at the ground level, but it may go higher, a, a small cell could fill in mobile coverage and be, be shared by the carriers. That was sort of the plan of, again, a VTA, but we don't have a VTA. I can see why it would serve a role uh, of, of filling in the gaps, um, using not the technology necessarily that the last VTA used, but to find a way to work with if, what's now available to fill in the gaps. So that's the same thing. Likewise, the two-way services, the public safety, those sorts of services need fill-in repeaters and fill-in well, fill receivers. And so they can use the backhaul network as well as the poles to, you know, in, in the long term uh, that are initially put in for fixed wireless to reach people who are not yet served on fiber. Uh, now, as far as the relationship of cell phones, it's very tricky very tricky business as to how cell and mo mobile relates to fixed wireless and to broadband. Cell phones are not broadband. You have kind of a bimodal place where cell phone infrastructure and broadband infrastructure can overlap. Um, if you're dealing in a very remote location, then this, if you put up a macro cell site, It'll have capacity both for all the mobile traffic that it's going to see and to provide fixed service to the small number of homes it'll see. Um, and that's sort of the VTEL strategy where it has fixed and mobile. And it's new, just recently, uh, last week, funded uh, cells with the, the, the massive will have enough capacity to serve a larger number of homes than before, as well as still provide mobile service. So you do have the places where the low density means there aren't too many homes for the mobile network to use. It's literally its spare capacity to serve fixed and mobile. That doesn't scale up very far. At the other extreme, you have something we don't like to talk about out loud. Uh, the term is 5G. And this is, frankly, I'm not a fan either. 5G is this notion of densifying urban cell sites, building small cells, higher frequencies to fill in urban areas to give higher capacity so, such that maybe even in the city, they won't need fiber. This is an excuse by a couple of very large companies that are both wireline, AT&T and Verizon or wireline and mobile to invest more in their mobile side and less in their wireline side and say, well, people don't need fiber anymore. We're not going to maintain our wireline plant. We're just going to use 5G fixed. Well, that's not proven. I have serious doubts that that's a good idea in urban areas. Urban areas should be fibered up. Um, but again, we're looking at these two different models in the middle, which is most of Vermont, frankly, th they're two different technologies and the um, fixed is a less expensive than the mobile. They can overlap. And what we had originally talked about at CV Fiber, my team uh, had come up with an idea working with VTEL was that we could in fact build capacity that would be primarily 
used for fixed, but would also by using VTEL's mobile spectrum and connecting to their network using their license, it would also provide mobility. It was primary fixed, secondary mobility. And to do that, it had to use mobile capable equipment at a somewhat higher price, but we would have done that um, for various reasons that they have not decided to do that at this point. But that concept is, is possible. But in general, the, you know, the fixed world can fill in gaps and serve neighborhoods of you know, 10 homes, which you can't do using mobile technology. So you know, even fewer than 10 homes, you can you know, reach uh, much farther, much more cheaply if you uh, are just doing fixed. So there are niche markets where each technology needs to be looked at. Um, so that's really where there's a key difference between the two. Um, other, other question to answer here is that the role of the electric utilities is critical. The pole attachment information is important. Uh, I have serious doubts about the harvesting technology that was proposed. Uh, I'd like to, you know, learn more about it before, you know, making up any my own mind up on it. But certainly, you know, I do have locations of GMP, WEC, and I think VEC have you know, made their poll locations public, but who's on the poll is proprietary. And that does impact the cost of adding another provider to the poll. And also if there's an existing fiber provider and they're willing to make their fiber available at a reasonable price, well, you don't have to build the whole thing yourself. Maybe you could, you know, lease rather than overbuild. That's again, something people are the American model was let's discourage competition by saying, if you want to be an internet provider, you got to pull your own fiber. That's crazy. You know, it, one fiber has huge, virtually infinite capacity. Why do we need to pull more fiber rather than share the fiber that's on the pole? And, and that's really been the problem in the U S that the model has been pull your own fiber and sharing fiber lets it go a lot farther uh, for the same amount of money. Uh, building it because you're sharing it among more users who can then uh, share its cost. Okay, that's, that, that's basically what, how, I, how I look at the situation and why we need to keep those in mind. Uh, any questions? Questions at this point. Okay. Sounds like if we're gonna make this work, we have to buck the entire American history of independent, profitability, but it makes sense. And that's part of what the CUDs then are asking. If they're, they can do a neighborhood or a mountain, but they need to know where the nearest fiber hub is that they can plug into, because they're not rewiring all the way to I'm not sure where. Well, so that's well, that, part of what they need to know? Well, that's the, one of the questions they need to answer because the CUD has to decide, are, you know, do they have enough subsidies to reach 100% on fiber, which frankly requires right. subsidies? Do they have enough or, or can they, without subsidies, just with reasonable access to inexpensive capital, reach 80% on fiber and 20% on wireless? Um, and also there's a question, quite honestly, of the incumbent telephone company, do they want to cooperate and work with the CUD or are they a competitor in, all the time? Does Consolidated or Otelco or TDS, uh, you know, do they want to cooperate? Uh, so, you know, VTEL's already built fiber to the home, but there's a lot of old copper and it's... You know, it's some of not much of it's getting replaced by the telephone companies unless they have subsidy money. Okay. Replacing okay. copper with copper. Well, no, replacing copper with fiber, but you don't re you don't replace copper copper with anything without subsidy money in a lot of these places. In and out of the remote places or any places. Well, really, in Vermont, there are not many places where unsubsidized maintenance is happening. You know, the um, other than urban core areas, you know, fiber isn't profitable without some degree of subsidization. Um, you know, there are 
you've got the how did how did EC fiber do it? Uh, very gradually, very slowly, and they had some low cost loans from um, residents of the area. That's how they started, but how are they doing it now? Well, now they're able to borrow money at at a reasonable at, at a rather you know favorable rate. Okay. Right, Madam Chair, I would suggest that EC Fiber did it because they started in a place where there there was the least right. competition. Where yes. it was it was it was so devoid that they could get sign up rates that were that reasonable. Right, but many other places are not operating with such an advantage which is which goes back to we shouldn't be subsidizing for profits to build out and make it more difficult for cud oh, that you know now that we've got the cuds up and looks like they may be in a position to start stringing if we can get them the poll information. Um, we can do more of that. A year ago, there was EC Fiber in central Vermont and a couple of smaller ones that are thinking about it. And I think we learned yesterday they're a lot farther along than they were and they're working cooperatively. So, okay. I don't know about anybody else, but I feel like I've just been given a two year graduate course in two yeah. hours. And it's going to take a while to process all of that. Anything written, I like bullets and outlines, but I think anything written, because um, we're dealing on two levels. One is, We've got kids that are going to be doing remote learning next week and they don't have access to fiber and a lot of them don't have access to childcare and their parents need to work probably more than their parents did last spring because the parents had been sent home either for a load or working remotely. Um, so we're trying to make sure that on an emergency basis, we get as many kids hooked up as possible without doing harm to future plans. Um, and I think that's one reason we looked at the fixed wireless because it's easier. And I believe some of the testimony yesterday was that the fixed wireless, you, you have to every five years or so, you have to upgrade the the, the facilities. The, well, in, the... in general, it's 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 more because it's more electronics. Yeah, the technology changes, and you can okay. generally look so at a five-year depreciation. It, it's a good interim, perhaps. On the other hand, maybe they don't come down as easily as cable does in a blizzard or an ice storm, or so. There's True. and we've talked about redundancy with the e nine one one ability um all of which makes me feel like we need to hire a consultant <laughs> but um okay so next steps i start to feel like i need a list of exactly how many committees and advisory groups are involved in all of this because one of you threw out one i'd never heard of um but we have a, an oversight committee that's going to be working with the public service department. And we've got a list of folks that should be on that, including CUDs, Velco. I've also heard a lot of interest in that we do some further work with Velco and the electric companies for access to their wire. And I, last time we had them in, which was the last time we met in person a whole six, eight months ago, um, the, the utilities and 
um, we, I think it was the co-ops, especially in a Washington electric co-op was very interested in working. So it's probably time we get them in for an update on their progress and get Velco in again. Um, and we need to figure out how we get the poll information, not necessarily where they are, but what's on them and who determines what is proprietary information. Do we, do the companies, can we just say it's not? That would probably get us in court, right? Okay. We don't well, like court. The question is what have, have and, and I think this is a question that I asked uh, Peter a little bit earlier. Uh, Fred, from your experience, are there any other states that have tackled this? And if so, how well or poorly have they succeeded? I don't think any really have tackled this, frankly. It's you know, it, it's difficult and um a lot have not many are as rural as Vermont and have as much of the of the problem. Um, you you have different approaches in different states, and uh, no one has they, they've started. There was a point about twenty years ago when Pennsylvania was going to apparently create a loopco, but then Verizon pushed back very hard and lobbied and stopped it. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, <laughs> yeah, right. So the the incumbents, you know, wield power. And that's really, you know, stopped a lot of things from happening around the country. You have local solutions and, you know, municipal network here, state subsidized network there. Um, but you, you don't have any states that have really uh, taken the lead to fix the system. So, Madam, Madam Chair? Yes. In, the, in this interim period where where we don't have a 10 year plan and we've extended it. Um, and our current plan that we've extended doesn't provide clear guidance. We, our committee has received from the commissioner um, assurances to work hard to um, extend, um, I mean, to connect where we have world class service. I'm not talking 25 3. Um, to extend world-class service where it's possible and, um, and to help CUDs organize with the future goal of, ex of achieving world-class service. And the report we had the other day that Commissioner has been, has done, has, has followed the commitment that, that she shared with us a, a month or two ago. And there's a long time between now and next year when the new 10, when the new 10 year plan is perhaps available. Is there any assistance that we can provide the commissioner and in in her authority to meet that commitment that she's pledged to us and to give her some back point back up so when when uh, Comcast comes in and says we want money we want money the commissioner can say no without appearing to be uh, yeah. arbitrary. I think we can produce some guidelines and put some conditions on any money that goes out. I know once we talked about they could string it, but they had to turn it over to the CUDs. That didn't go over very well. Uh, but I think, yes, that's that's something that we can do. And we, ah, Senator Ballin is- that bas basically is our challenge. Is our yeah. challenge. Yeah, that um, is our challenge. It might, may simply add that this, I'm not speaking for or against um, uh, the, the poll wireless, which may right. be very effective in some places and not so effective in others, depending on topography. But right. those that the, the big picture there, how do we protect and help the commissioner to meet the commitment that she's made between now and, and the next plan? Okay. And I think that's something we can all think about. I'm gonna try and give you a break because we have little things like the Act 250 bill <laughs> coming up. <laughs> Just little, this was supposed to be the light part of the afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna try and give you a break so you can
get a cup of coffee and wake up and um, kind of clear the brain for a couple minutes. Um, so, so anything that any of our witnesses can give us in writing, because we've got several problems. One, we've got COVID money in play um, and there may be more, uh, there may not, but there's a good chance there will be some left over since the system has to be up and running by December 30th. So um, we're running out of time to let grants and have any reasonable expectation that something's going to be running. And so what do we do with the leftover money? Is there some place we could invest it before it gets sent back to business grants or loans? And how do we proceed? We've got some money for COVID resiliency planning, um, which is going on. We've got COVID money there, but we also have the 10-year plan. And I believe there was $300,000 in play. That's why it got moved to hire a consultant. Um, and I believe that that is still either went through in the original budget or should be in this one. Um, but the problem, of course, is the 300,000 is inadequate to do the plan. Right. Yeah, uh, you're right. And if we had 300 million, we could fix this problem. But I think one of the things we need to put just reading the last plan is a the department is been planning to the dollars and the only dollars they've had is the connectivity fund. And so they've been planning on, well, you know, we got $10,000 a year or 20, um, what, what do we do with it? And rather than say, this is what our goal should be and these are reasonable steps and hand it to us and then let us worry about funding it. Um, I mean, the last one was, but if you go only got a couple thousand a year, you're not going to get much vision. And I think maybe, maybe by a year from now, we'll have $300 million from the federal government and we'll be back to rural electrification, but um, I'm not holding my breath. So with that, in let, uh, Senator Ballant. Thank you. I was um, wanting to ask a question of Peter earlier and uh, Faith and I were trying to get me off of mute and we could not figure it out because I was, uh, the, the Bluetooth would not allow muted, it. So, huh? Yes, so um, Peter, you had mentioned something earlier about uh, a broadband coalition in Massachusetts. And I was not able to, to get the name of that. Is that a public private partnership or is that housed within state government? I, I'm really not very expert on it. I know that it, it has existed for some years. I believe it's a state agency. Fred, Fred has worked with them in Northern Berkshire. So could I yield to Fred? Oh, absolutely. Yes, well, there is a state agency uh, called the Massachusetts Broadband Institute. Now it's downscaled quite a bit. It used to be fairly large. It's it's residual at this point providing funding. But there was a bond that uh, funded them that make capital available to municipalities to bring broadband to underserved un and unserved areas. So uh, that agency money is been, has been distributed among the towns. Some are using it to build fiber. Basically, the amount of money was that about one third of the capital cost of a fiber build would come from MBI and the rest would come from the town and the subscribers. Uh, now, in the towns I'm working in, the capital cost of a wireless network is less than one third of the cost of fiber. So we were able to take the, take the subsidy money that was intended to be part of fiber and use it to entirely build wireless. These are relatively low tax rateable uh, 
less wealth. They're, they're, the towns that don't have the fancy summer homes to pay the taxes. Right. <laughs> and, and so- Or you know, university. Building, right. So, 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 we're, so we're building this network now. Um, essentially the towns own it and it's being done by two companies, Otelco and Y Valley to uh, actually build out the network. Well, thank you. I was uh, very curious to do some reading about how long that they have been in operation and how many towns they've been able to service at this point. It's an interesting model to look at. And I think thank you. I did have someone from there come and talk to me like after hours, maybe a year ago. But at that point, we had said fiber or nothing. And I think what we've heard today is an argument that given what we've learned in the last six months, nothing really isn't an option. And that perhaps if we want to do this quickly, that wireless is a very viable option. And if we want to get something um, up that last house, because you might have some camps, but up there you got some folks living too, and they've got school kids if we want to get it there. Um, then wireless might be a way to go. And there was a news item on last night about two little girls who were homeless um, sitting on the steps at the local, I think it was a Burger King, tuned into the hotspot to do their schoolwork. And my first reaction was, yeah, this is California. They can do that in January, but not in Vermont. And we have so many kids that the best we can tell them is hopefully you've got a car that'll start in January with tires that will go in January and you can drive down to some parking lot and download your homework and then go home and do it and come back and download it. And that's also assuming you've got parents who are available and who can do that. So not a real viable option for a lot of kids. And I think the necessity of getting something out to them is. Uh, Madam Chair, may I close this? Was. Oh, Madam Chair. Steve. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to close with, leave you with one thought that the window is rapidly closing to uh, engineer and install any fixed wireless around the state. It's been engineered for CV fiber, but they've declined to pursue it. Uh, there are other areas of the state that don't have design started yet. But if, if you want to consider the benefits of using these very quickly, you're going to need to do two things. You're going to need to immediately pull the trigger on getting those designs, uh, what I call auger ready. An auger is the hole used, the tool used to drill a hole to set a pole. I, and I secondly, know what an auger is. you're going to need to ask, prevail upon the governor to convene the, the distribution utilities, Washington Electric, Vermont Electric, and Green Mountain Power, because the only way you'll get any fixed wireless installed in this short time frame is by mobilizing those utilities that have the auger trucks and the bucket trucks to uh, mount this stuff. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an urgent matter, in my opinion, and it hasn't been adopted and set in motion, and that window is closing very, very rapidly.